Welcome to Perspectives El Paso. I'm Professor Leon Blevins, Professor of Government at El Paso Community College. For many years, I've had a very close friend at El Paso Community College named Hector Serrano. And Hector Serrano teaches speech and drama. He produces Shakespeare on the Rocks. For many years, he's produced, he did produce Viva El Paso in McKelligan Canyon. And at one point, he stopped me about 1989, somewhere in there, and he asked me if I would love to come to the Shamazal for something called the First Thanksgiving Reenactment. And so I went, I observed it for several years in a row in April, and then he approached me and said, could you be a character in this production, uh, more of a greeter than a performer? And I said, okay, I would be glad to do that. And then along came 1998, and uh, something came up called the Quadricentennial. A man named Don Juan de Oñate, a Spanish conquistador, had come up from Mexico and became the first governor of New Mexico. And so Hector enlisted me to participate with that, so I did. Eventually Hector pulled out for a while and Mary Davis of the Mission Valley Association and Sheldon Hall, who helped start that association, and I was approached about uh, doing Don Juan de Oñate, and I did. I discovered that was controversial. In fact, on two different occasions, I and others were demonstrated against because we were portraying this man who they claimed had done horrible things. Then in 2007, April of 2007, I went to the airport for the unveiling of the statue done by an internationally known sculptor named John Hauser. So here you see a picture of the sculpture, an equestrian horse originally supposed to be called Don Juan de Oñate, and due to demonstrations, the name was changed. So here I am in the picture here with John Hauser and have been able to get him on the show. John, glad yeah, to have yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate being here. Perspectives El Paso. Okay, good. Now the theme <laughs> of the interview today is public art and the 12 travelers, because Don Juan de Oñate was one of this group of sculptures you contracted to do. And so tell us about this. How did you get in on this project? I was in, I was in El Paso. I was in Tucson at the time, and I have a friend here who's an attorney, and he had been working with my brother on the t with the Tiu Indians, and uh, this was Tom Diamond, mm -hmm. and he invited me to come over and do a series of paintings and sculptures of the Tiu Indians. He was very interested in a very interesting group of people, so I was I did I moved over here and I and I began that project, and during that time the uh, city of El Paso was trying to renovate the downtown, and. Uh, encourage tourism and so on. So they were, they were asking the public for I to contribute ideas, you know, what, what, what can we do? I think they've done that two or three times since. Right. Anyway, one of the ideas I had was to do a series, because of my interest in history, was to do a series of, of big monuments depicting the history of the Pass of the North, beginning in 1535 with Cabeza de Vaca and taking them Suriatum right up to Pancho Villa. Mm -hmm. So you cover everybody, you know, it include Indians, it include blacks, it include uh, some Spaniards and, and Anglos. What about a woman? Woman too, there are two women. Okay. That we know of it, and there could, uh, actually there could be three. Mm -hmm. and In the current list, I think there are three. So uh, anyway, so, it, and, and also, and, and it, it sort of like covers the, 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 the spectrum of the different kinds of people that came through the Pass of the North. Uh, some were good, some were bad, some were, a few, a few were, were exceptional, you know, but, but they all left their mark in the Southwest. They all contributed something that, that made the Southwest the way it is that we see it today. Now, what was the first sculpture that you finished for the city? Well, okay, well, if, it, was a pro, it was a TIFF project, and I had, I had to make, a, make an application to it. Anyway, it was, it was approved by the, by the TIFF board, and it was approved with great enthusiasm. And uh, of course, then immediately a little controversy started. But uh, they finally decided after about three or four years of, of hard work on our part to try to promotion and, and trying to develop the, uh, the basic support to the point where, where, the, where the project would, could go ahead. Uh, uh, so the first one you did was? That they put the down first down. one was Fray Garcia de San Francisco. They, the city told us to do the first two as sort of a test, okay. when, and, they, and, they, and, they, and they set up a, um, the city council members, each, each selected a, a member of this committee to make the selection. And I had one person on the committee too, but they, but it was, they decided that they wanted Don Juan de Oñate to be the equestrian, and they wanted uh, Fray Garcia to be the, the standing figure, and those were the two figures we were told to go ahead with. Now this is a combination 
public and private funding, right? No, that no. That at this time, this was this was city money. Okay, and this was tax city increment money. financing money. At yeah, that's TIF, right. That's yeah, that's but but the thing is that the contract I had allowed me to. Uh, enhance these projects if I raise the money privately to do so. Boy, did you ever enhance this one? Yeah, yeah. Well, Prey Garcia was enhanced from one and a half to twice life size. It was the largest standing figure in the state of Texas when it was installed. H how tall is this? And this one is, is 36 feet tall. It's four and a half times life size. Oh, my goodness. So we exceeded the one and a half uh, times size uh, recommendation by far. And now, this, this meant you went uh, over budget, it meant it went over time. Do you ever have any regrets about raising it to that size since it did take you so long and you weren't able to finish uh, some of the others? Well, I, you know, it was, it, was, it was fairly easy to raise the money for, the, uh, for Fry Garcia. Okay. So I, did, I, had, I had a lot of confidence it would be able to do that. In fact, that was my first intention was to make the, this, this statue the same size at the same scale as the Fry Garcia statue. Right. So one and a half times life size. And, and as I began to develop the maquette, I developed a little sculpture about this big that I would sit on the table and then <laughs> put it down on the floor and you know pretend it was big you know, and try to see it in all angles, try to get an idea of, of what the composition was going to look like. And uh, then I found out that there was a horse and um, a rider in, in Philadelphia that was George Washington actually. Mm -hmm. It was just a little bit bigger than the one that I was planning. So I thought, well, I'll make it a little bit bigger in El Paso. We'll have a, a record. It was put, the other one was built as, as the biggest statue, biggest equestrian in the United States. Now you're talking like somebody from Texas instead of Arizona. Texas. Well, it was big. so it was so close. I we'll just make it a little bit bigger, and then <laughs> then El Paso will have the record. Yeah, I'll give it to Texas too. Uh, so I did that, and then then about that, just a little bit later, I, I realized that there was also another horse that was being built, and that was the Da Vinci horse, mm -hmm. and that was 21 feet at the weather at the withers, I think. Mm -hmm. So I so I just and that was supposed to be the biggest equestrian in the world. So I decided I, that wasn't that much bigger than what I was already doing. So I thought, well, enhance it a little bit more. <laughs> and so, so I, and then I added a little bit of extra. I had another a meter and a half or so, so that I wouldn't have to feel that there was somebody else that was coming along in the wings, you know, that was well, by, doing, while doing this, bigger. you certainly have brought recognition to yourself and to the city of El Paso. Yeah, yeah, it has. It has. It's got, it's, it, it, was well, it was featured in the New York Times on the front page. It, w it was featured in the National Sculpture Society. It was featured in a lot of a lot of uh, art magazines back east, and also throughout the Southwest. So it's, it's got received a lot of a lot of recognition. But it also cost us uh, ten years to do it. Yeah. And and we had a lot of lot of headaches along the way. We ran into. Uh, uh, it was an incredible adventure story. We went down. We couldn't find a studio that was big enough. Okay. So in the in the United States, I didn't find one that I could rent that was big enough. So I, I, a friend of mine in Mexico, a monumental sculptor, very great sculptor, a friend of mine, would said that he said, "Come down here." He said, "There's a foundry I know of," and he said, "They're willing to build a studio for you and cast a piece too." And it was a foundry he had been using. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, that sounds great, you know. So. We put the little maquette, and that wasn't a little maquette, the little maquette was about this big now, it was in the enlarging maquette. Put it in a car, I went down there with my son. We drove down, the way, on the way to Torreon, we were sideswiped by a semi and almost killed. We had to rent a car, we but, the, but, the, but the maquette was safe because it was in, 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 uh, covered over in, uh, in styrofoam. And we got the maquette down there and we started enlarging. And we gave, gave the man that we were working with $40,000 in contract to begin structure, uh, begin building the, con the begin the construction of the of the uh, of the enlarging studio, with, which would be 40 feet high, mm -hmm. and uh, also to pay our workers, and then we found out that he wasn't paying the workers. They actually started the enlarging studio. They laid the foundation. They had the walls up so far and so on. But then it was something like problem. You know, there was no money coming. Well, I remember that a, a film, a video was made by Mr. Valadez about this. It shows you coming from Santa Fe down to El Paso with this. Finished product on the on the truck, and uh, putting it all together. Well, that was ten years later. That was <laughs> ten right. years later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, we could spend for, forever down in Mexico getting to that point. But well, we went, we went into a lawsuit for for seven or eight months. You know, we had yeah. a lot. Of, we have a lot of slowdowns. There yeah. was funding problems too. But yeah, then we did we'd get it. It was cast in uh, in it was it was cast in uh, in Shadoni and in Santa Fe, mm -hmm. and it was assembled in Lander, Wyoming, mm -hmm. by uh, by Eagle Bronze. So this was an international event taking place. It was an international event, yeah. And, and you have become internationally known. Uh, at this particular event, there were some of my current students and former students that were demonstrating, and some of the natives from Acoma, New Mexico, had come down and were demonstrating about this. But I think in many ways it tells us something about, and I was telling my students this, we're 
or challenge me about it, portraying Don Juan de Oñate. We may not want to celebrate someone with his history of brutality to people. That was a period of colonialism. The French, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the English, and others were taking lands from others and decimating them, as happened here in our area. But I said, we want to remember, maybe not celebrate Oñate, but commemorate the fact that he changed the Southwest. He gave us the Spanish language in this part of the world. He gave us, gave us the kind of animals that we have mm -hmm. in the introduction in this part of the world. Laws that were introduced into this mm -hmm. part of the world. Food that was introduced into this part of the world. We are what we are today in this part of the world and because the horse, of people too. like this. Yeah. Yes, and the horse mm -hmm. and the weapons yeah. that were brought in. Mm -hmm. And this is a part of our history. Now, we want to give you a chance also, mention a few of the others that you have finished or are moving toward finishing in the 12th Well, my travels. son who began working with me at the age of 17 as an apprentice. And his name is? It's Ethan Taliesin Hauser. Okay. And uh, anyway, he's, he just continually got better and better and better. He's a very talented guy. And then he's, he's so good that he actually did the last uh, 12 Travelers on his own, which was Susan McGoffin. And where is that And placed? that's in Keystone Heritage Park, and that was unveiled in June. Okay. So anyway, that's, uh, that's a feather in his cap. And, and also, I've, I've asked him now to become the co-sculptor on this project. Now, what's the so net one you're working on now? We're, we're working on Benito Juarez. Benito Juarez. Yes, uh-huh. Okay. And, and, it, and it's, a, it's a concept that I developed in 1970. I was in, I was in Oaxaca painting. I lived in Mitla for a while, and then I moved to Oaxaca City. And one time I had a chance to visit Galatao up on the mountainside on the east coast, on, on the eastern slope of the, of the Oaxaca Valley. And uh, the little town of San Galatao, San Pablo de, uh, de Galatao, and that's the town that, uh, that Benito Juarez was born in. Mm -hmm. And when he was 12, he left Galatao and walked 30 miles to the, to the city of, to, of, of Oaxaca by himself to gain, look for an education. Now, I was shown a picture of that sculpture as it's progressing, and it shows a book behind him. Why do you have the book behind him? Because, uh, because it was, education is such a big, big, uh, big element of, of, of Benito Warriors' development, and, al and also it, it's, a, it's a big, big element in this sculpture, too. Because I, when I was in that, when I was in Galatao, I saw a little Indian boy go by, mm -hmm. and he looked just like a young Benito Warriors to me. Wow. So I always remembered that. So now when we're de developing the concept for the monument, I wanted to put Benito Juarez as a child sitting on one side of the bench with a book in his hand, and he's just beginning his adventure that will take him eventually to become the president who's sitting opposite him on the other side of the bench. Oh, my word. So it's, it's, two, it's two figures in, in, in one monument, both, both representing the same man, the same person, at different ages. How tall will this sculpture be? It'll be a little over, over, over life size. Not, 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 nothing like that. But it'll be a, a little, uh, it'll be a, enough over life size that when you see it, you'll see, you realize that this was somebody that was important in history. At the dedication of this statue, a, a man from Spain that you had invited to come for the dedication came over and wanted me to pose for a picture with him that he could take back to Spain. And he said, my face is on this statue. That's right. I went over to Spain to do research on this, went to the Armaria, and, and we copied a lot of the information about the different kinds of uh, adornment ornament on the tack. It's all 16th mm -hmm. century Spanish, mm -hmm. uh, 17th century Spanish uh, ornament. And uh, that's Manuel Guione de, de Oñate. He's a collateral descendant of, of Don Juan de Oñate. Okay. And he was very, very helpful because he took me, or took me around, introduced me to people in, in Madrid. And we also went on a trip up into the Oñate, into the Basque country where Oñate was, was where the Oñate family originated. Mm -hmm. So I got a really good idea of what the background was and, and tried to make this as authentic as I could and still you know, still keep it within the realm of art. Well, now when you do public art, you do create controversy sometimes depending on the objects or I've, people. I don't do that. think you can do it without it. If, <laughs> if you do it without it, it's a failure. <laughs> and I've that. been to Chicago and see all that public art up there and it's really, and it, we hear all the discussions going on about some like it, some don't like it and some. Yeah. Now we do want to give you a chance to mention some other places that you have art placed. Sculptures perhaps? Tell us about some of the other places where you've signed contracts and done some sculptures already. Well I've, I've done a number of them around the United States like in Sacramento, California with a statue of uh, of, a, of the first Hispanic bishop, and uh, I've done. There's an. I have another sculpture there too. That I also Ethan worked on both of those with me, and uh, but recently I just I had a show in Rome, in uh, in May of this year at, at uh, uh, about 50 drawings and some paintings, and uh, and then I had had a bust that I did of Francis Sir Francis Crick, who was uh, I discovered the DNA structure along with James Watson. 
And uh, that was started some time ago from life and completed about a year ago and unveiled in Cambridge uh, this, uh, this, this summer. Well, congratulations. Yeah. That's quite an honor. Uh -huh. So then I, then I also have a lot, of, a lot of the drawings that I've done from sketchbooks over about 50 years, plus paintings and, and sculptures on display at the uh, International Museum of Art here in El Paso right now, which will run through October 26th. I was just at that particular event. I want to give you a chance to put a telephone number up or a website or something. I know I just typed in John Hauser in El Paso, Texas, and it brought up a lot of information about you. Do you have a telephone number in case somebody wants to purchase some of your, your paintings? Yeah, I've got two. Oh, two, okay. <laughs> uh, let, me, I, let me give you one, it'll be simpler. It's 505-471-9638. Uh, That's my landline in my studio in Madrid, New Mexico. Okay. And if I'm not there, just leave a message because I can pick it up. Okay. That's 505 four, uh, <laughs> it's a new, new telephone number, 471-9638. Uh, well, we've been given a card, so Marco Lara, my co-producer, can pull that off and be sure okay, that we've that, got that, it that's on good. There. That'll right. help, yeah. Uh, uh, also, with this business of uh, purchasing, do you sell some of the smaller versions of some of these? I know I purchased some uh, sculptures of a fellow named Dave McGarry up at Rio Dosa. Mm -hmm. And we have smaller versions of some of his big ones. Yeah, works. we have a smaller version of, of all the ones that have been done so far. Okay. And we also have a little little uh, head of Benito Juarez. It's completed now in bronze. I was going to try to bring it today, and I couldn't. Uh, mm -hmm. Didn't work out that way. But the head the head is about that size, and it's the same size as it will be on the maquette when the enlarging maquette when we finish it. Okay. But it shows it shows Benito Juarez in a, it's a figure about this high, and behind him is a big book, and that's the one you mentioned. Right. And we're selling that for five thousand dollars, and that will. Uh, there are 15, 15 of them that are available for sale. Collectors and those items. Are sp that's a special collector's edition. Mm -hmm. And and then that, that money will be used to develop the maquette and also give them a discount for the same amount on, on a purchase of the maquette once it's done. Now, your father, let's see, you were born in South Dakota and your father was helping to do the Mount Rushmore. He was assistant sculptor to Goosen Borgum on Mount Rushmore. And he did most of the work on the small enlarging maquettes, which were not that small. They were. The, the, pr the four presidents in the studio were six feet, six feet from hairline to chin, mm -hmm. and uh, then th from those that's th those are the heads they took the measurements from and then transferred up onto the mountain. So obviously, your father was your inspiration for going into this field. He he inspired me to become a painter. <laughs> a painter. <laughs> <laughs> I, you, you never want to follow in your father's footsteps. Oh, okay. So I, anyway, I, I painted for years and years, and I'm still painting. Okay. But I also uh, everywhere I went, I went through the Haight Ashbury, and I, I've traveled around the world. I've been with the Schwar Indians in southern in uh, South America. I've been with the with the Cherokee and Eastern Band of the Cherokee, and I've been through Appalachia. I've been with the Gullah Blacks in the South, living with these people, and 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 always doing art. Right. And uh, so anyway, I always had a little clay with me. So it was, it was really when I, so I was always doing a little bit of sculpture. But when I came to when I came to El Paso to do this work with Tom, and then we got involved in the sculpture project. That's when I began to do portraits first with uh, of of, uh, of, of, uh, of Abraham Chavez and also Jose Cisneros that are both on display here in El Paso. Mm -hmm. One in the UTEP library and the other is in the Chavez Center. So anyway, I did a lot of sculpture at that time. And, uh, and so I'm still doing a lot of sculpture. Well, here we are in October of 2012 and you still have a lot of work to do and a lot of creative ideas going around. I have a now, lot of ideas, yeah. And I, I met Stephen Hawking recently in, uh, in, uh, in Cambridge. Physicist, I was right? In, I, yeah. I was invited to a, to a, a banquet and, uh, and he was there. And it was a it was a banquet for the uh, for the uh, for the uh, first annual conference on consciousness uh, involving Fra Francis Crick too. Yeah. So anyway, that's why I unveiled it there. But Fran but uh, he Hawking was there, and I'm working on a sculpture of him right now. Okay. Now I have another guest coming on right after you today. Who is that? That must be my brother, I suppose. Your brother. Yeah. Nick. He's the historian, <laughs> and he, he, can, he can fill you on any aspect of El Paso history you care to listen to. <laughs> well, when I, I saw him at some event and met him a couple of years ago, I told him I wanted to get you on my program, and I said, uh, Nick, if I can't get John on the program, I want to have you on the program. And when we were able, I was at the International Museum of Art and saw you the other day, mm. and uh, I said, um, I, I think I'll get you on the show. And then I called Nick uh, last night and this morning we talked, and I said, Nick, I want to do a show with you too. And let's talk about some of these figures that uh, John is doing sculptures on. And he said, I especially want to talk about Benito Juarez. Yeah. 
Yeah. So after this particular program is over, we're going to have Nick on. I think we'll have. Good. He's made some program. original uh, discoveries in in his research. So okay. Be good. For people. And you traveling around the world like this, were you ever frightened or worried that? Bad things could happen to you because of controversies in some of these places and some of the natives that were there that you weren't quite sure about? Yeah, no, I've always had a really good rapport with the people I'm with. But, but one time when I was with the Syrian Indians, I, there was a young kid, wild, wild-eyed kid, about 18, 17, 18 years old, that I really wanted to paint. And I made arrangements for him to come and pose for okay. me. But he was an orphan, and he was a, a disturbed child. And uh, his, his name was Big Wind. They called him Chabasco, which is another word for a big one. He was born in the Syria. It was called Ha'ai, okay. but it was a big storm when he was born. And uh, anyway, he was. Uh, they were teasing him, so he didn't really have. He was an orphan. His parents had died, and he was sort of shut, shunted from one family to another. And they were always sort of taking the other Indians. They were always sort of taking advantage of him and teasing him. So they had been telling him that I was really looking out. I was really out to get him. And so he came, you know, he was, he was supposed to come and pose for me, so he got very scared. Mm -hmm. And he uh, had a machete under his shirt, and he was walking to his appointment with me along the path that afternoon, and he happened to run into one of the SIL Institute uh, missionary people down there and uh, who, who knew me and had lived with the series for a long time. But anyway, she said, where are you going, Shabasco? And he very naively said, I'm going to kill John. And she said, what? You must be kidding. He didn't know he had the knife there. He was ready to do it. Uh -huh. Anyway, she talked him out of it. So you're here, <laughs> thanks to her. She's your hero. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I, I later had him pose. And I, I still kept a hammer or something nearby as a weapon if I needed it. Yeah, right. And, uh, but, he, but he was good, and he became my friend. I, every time I went down there, I would take him a present, usually a knife. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, that's fascinating. But anyway, you know, you just get to know people. But that, that, was, that was a difficult case. I mean, other than that, I've never had any real problems. I've always been well accepted everywhere. W were you ever invited to do royalty? To paint someone who was considered royalty in a particular society or tribal chief? I know you probably didn't paint the Queen of England or something, did you? No, no, but I think the most important person I've, I've, I've portrayed probably is, is uh, Francis Crick. He's, con he's considered to be Fr uh, England's greatest scientist of the 20th century, and he's also considered to be Darwin's equivalent to the 20th century, just as Darwin was uh, the great scientist of the, uh, of the 19th. So he's a, he's a big name, and he's being celebrated this year. Uh, his discovery of DNA, and also is his work that he's done on consciousness. In other words, they're, put, they're building up a huge Francis Crick Institute in, in London. And uh, so anyway, he's being fated with great, great significance. Okay, hypothetical. If there's someone that you could choose today that you would want to do a sculpture of, a major sculpture, it doesn't have to be this big. Think of who you would like to do one. Well, you know, I, I don't, I'm not always as impressed with the people who are high up as I am individuals who have contributed, done, done unusual things. The common man that does unusual things. Well, or common girl. Okay. There's, there's, a, there's a, a young girl in Pakistan, Malala, uh -huh. who was recently shot in the head. She started a, a blog against uh, Pakistan and, 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 and advocating for the education of girl, young girls. Right, right. Uh, when she was eight, 11, I think that's phenomenal. I think some, I was thinking that a, a statue, a, 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 a sculpture of her would be something that I would enjoy doing. A true honor to her. Yeah, well, yeah. And what she was trying to achieve. somebody who's really, really a, a contributing something or, or has attempted to really contribute something significant and needed in the world. Uh -huh. I'm not sure the politicians uh, uh, merit that. <laughs> <laughs> Today, one of my colleagues, uh, not in government, but another field, as I was leaving uh, my classroom, she was coming in to have her class, and she asked why I was all dressed up, and, and I told her I was coming to interview you, and that you were a sculptor, and you did this sculpture. And she said, well, she had demonstrated against it being placed uh, downtown on Cleveland Square. And so I, I said, have you been to France? And she said, yes. I have said, have you seen statues of Napoleon? She said, yes, and he wasn't a very good man either. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And so sometimes some of these people who changed history weren't necessarily the greatest of people. That's right. You know, Houdon was one of the great French sculptors, and he did a, s a l ser series of busts. They're all beautiful busts, mm -hmm. uh, just before the French Revolution. 
And a lot of the people that he did were guillotined, you know, a few years later. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's interesting that we have those because it really gives us sort of an insight into what the other people looked at. You know, what the, you, could, you could even tell a lot by looking at somebody's face, what kind of life they live, and sometimes what they think, too. Yeah, if you look at European art, you see art that goes back to Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve, and all of these yeah. things, and then tracing through the That's history right. of religious art. Mm -hmm. And then you go through the naturalist period, mm -hmm. impressionist period, all of these kind of things. But... Uh, John, we just have a couple of more minutes left, and I do want to say thank you for contributing to El Paso and our culture and our history, and especially with regard to the Southwest and the Spanish history here. It's a great history, and I love it. And one thing I want to say is that the Twelve Travelers is not, never was about I individuals. It was always about dividing 400 years of our history into 12 different sections, segments, mm -hmm. and each segment would be would be represented by a certain period of history. So, e but each each period would be would also be have one iconic figure that would sort of stand for that period. And that's what Don, Don Juan de Oñate does it here. Right. And now what he really stands for is a period of Spanish colonization of the Southwest, which was from 1598 to 1680 when the Pueblo Rebellion sort of kicked the Spanish out. But during up to that time, there was a certain, certain period of development with the Spanish that uh, is significant, left, left tremendous traces here in, the, in our culture. Are, th are there any people in El Paso that you would like, I know uh, Sheldon Hall, and any besides Sheldon Hall that you'd like to give thanks to for their support for your work? Many people. I would like to uh, thank, thanks, to, thank Tom Lee for his support when he was alive, and Jose Cisneros, and uh, um, our present mayor. He was the one, one of the people that, that sort of stepped forward and, and, and helped us uh, find a place for this. That's John needed. Cook? Yeah, you're right. And, yeah, and uh, pay, had Abel. Yeah, they're, they're t and, and then all the members of the 12 Travelers Board who dedicated years and years of their life and as volunteers, you know, to, to sustain us when we were developing this period. This, we, they ne we never got much money, but we got enough to live on. And we also had to deal with the politics, and they, they dealt with the fundraising. It was, it was it, without, without that support, it was extremely unusual support. Uh, the quality of it was was fantastic. I would not try to not be duplicated anywhere easily. Right, anyway, right. I want to thank them. And I want to thank you for being on our show today, John. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. And I look forward to having your, your brother Nick on the show. Great. Okay. We might even talk about you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, keep your place there. Yeah. And we want to bid farewell to our audience today. Thanks for tuning in to another program we call Perspectives El Paso. This has brought a unique view of El Paso and public art.